Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and welcome on behalf of uh, McGill University, its Faculty of Medicine, the Dean, Dr. Eidelman, uh, and on behalf of the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Occupational Health, that's a mouthful, I would like to welcome you all to this uh, fall 2014 edition of McGill's Minimed. My name is Gilles Paradis. I am the uh, chairman of the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Occupational Health, uh, which is very proud uh, this year uh, because it's uh, celebrating its 50th anniversary as a formal department uh, at McGill University, and even prouder because uh, we had the opportunity to showcase uh, some of our best and brightest faculty members of our department and uh, who will be presenting to you some of their research and uh, some of uh, their experiences in the field of public health, clinical medicine, and uh, public policy. What do epidemiologists, biostatisticians, occupational health scientists, public health officials do? Well, you will hear about all of this during these uh, six uh, sessions. Uh, and uh, we're very fortunate tonight to be starting with one of our uh, most distinguished professor in our department, Dr. James Hanley, is a biostatistician uh, who obtained his PhD from the University of Waterloo uh, and then uh, worked at uh, Harvard University for a few years before coming to McGill and uh, teaching now for the past 30 years. I was very fortunate uh, to have uh, Jim as one of my first professors when I began uh, at McGill uh, a couple of decades ago. Uh, and uh, he's continued on strong ever since, winning uh, teaching awards uh, at McGill and uh, becoming one of our uh, not only best teacher, best mentor, and certainly best ambassador of the department. So tonight, uh, the title of this presentation is Figuring Out What Makes Population Sick, Unraveling Disease Mysteries. Jim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jill, and uh, thank you all for coming out on a cold night. Um, I think if we had... Uh, if we had proposed to the mini-med people 14 years ago, it was that you started, I think, that we would have a series on epidemiology, people would have said, what? What's that? Uh, it's a little different now, and as the world unfolds, it's getting more that people can not just spell the word, but understand what it is. Um, so I'm going to start by saying yes, indeed, uh, try and describe what it is we do. We have a faculty of 80 or 90 uh, professors, so it's very, very difficult to pick six. But we will each uh, evening from now on also roll a screen with one slide per faculty member just to show the variety of work that goes on in our department. It's very, very, very broad and very different than epidemiology was four or 500 years ago. Uh, I'll only go back 150 years, I think that's enough. <laughs> but I will start there, in your great-grandfather's time, great-grandparents' time, when life expectancy in Canada was about 40 years, and today it's over 80. And most of you, being in this medical building, are thinking that's due to the advances in medicine. And I have to tell you, it's not. It's due to the advances in public health practice and public health efforts, by and large. Yes, we have antibiotics when you get sick, but epidemiologists' job is to try and keep you from getting sick in the first place. And uh, so I will begin by uh, actually, because our goal in, in community health medicine is, is uh, pr more prevention than anything else. So I will begin by distinguishing the two. Uh, and then talk about the research that drives and that advances the knowledge base for the practitioners of community medicine and more broadly public health. There's an awful lot riding on the activities and on getting it right and it isn't always easy and I'm going to explain compared to the lab people we don't get much respect, we're usually uh, only there, thought of when things go wrong, but 
the uh, attitude that we have is that if things are going right, we're happy, we're out, out, out of the limelight. Um, so I'm going to, I think, explain here that it's not easy. And when researchers did often produce evidence that should have driven public health practice, they weren't listened to, it was difficult to convince them. That's why I have to go back as far as I do. And we have some 20th and 21st century mistakes as well. Not everything we do is always right first time. I showed you at the very beginning, before the lecture, the uh, largest public health experiment ever, 1.8 million children. Some of you may have been in it. You certainly remember it. Some of you were in it. We have one here who was. Uh, and uh, I, it's dismal looking right at that point, but you're going, I'm going to end on a positive note because I think we need some positive notes at this point, even if we have to go back some years to look for them. So I will start and say uh, the way I think of the differences between community and clinical medicine. And I think it's fairly simple. We go as patients to the doctor one at a time to be cared for one at a time. But the community, the community doctor, his client is the entire population that he serves. And as I said before, keeping people healthy and keeping them from becoming patients is really the definition of public health and community medicine. Uh, here's another definition that's a bit too long, but uh, I think if you just remember the idea that it's organized community effort, education, sanitation, uh, food inspection, water quality, everything like that. It's not easy, that's for sure. And why is it not easy compared to the people in this building who study rats and mice and cells? The reason is because we study intact human beings. We don't study pieces of us, we study the intact human being, and many of them at a time. And you know the expression, herding cats? Well, it's a little bit like that in our business. You cannot do this to people, at least nowadays. Uh, but this is the difference. This is the difference. And uh, the other thing that I think makes it different is the time scales. Very often, you can figure out what it was you ate yesterday that gave you the rash or the headache today, or what it was that you were exposed to last week that's making you sick today. But we're going to see examples here where the time scale not is just in weeks or months, but in uh, decades. And so trying to go back and figure out what happened isn't always easy. The third one, I think, is also something people don't realize. When you're sick and you go to the doctor and he or she suggests an operation that might have a risk of 1 in 10 and 1 in 100, depending on how serious the condition you have is, you might take it, right? Because that would be better than the alternative. But when you're dealing with deciding to give the Sabin vaccine or the Salk vaccine to an entire population, risks of 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 100,000 matter. Because if you get it wrong, you can do a lot of damage, and, you may, and then you're in the prevention business, so you're not preventing many, and you can do more damage than, than good if you're not careful. So the scale factor is a big deal in population health that isn't there when you're a patient ready to take a chance in medicine. A clarification, first of all, I said we're going to be talking mainly about ep epidemiology research, not epidemiology practitioners. And the other thing is that lots of epidemiology now, just like me, I'm not an MD. Uh, lots of epidemiology is done by PhDs. And so I have to explain why that is. And uh, this is a story from the joys of Yiddish, where the, I can't pronounce it well, but this is what she said. And uh, she said, but what kind of disease is <laughs> philosophy? <laughs> so... Uh, we're going to be talking about disease and sickness more broadly even than disease. And this is a very interesting and very readable book. It has five or six pages each and the top 30 killers of all time. And here are some of them. And my goodness, look at that. Look at that hazmat, hazmat uh, from the 1600s. That's hazmat in the 1600s, right? Trying to ward off what? What are they trying to ward off? The plague, yes, exactly. And they thought it came from the air. They thought all sorts of things, yeah. So we're going to concentrate on three, and we're going to leave the one with the question mark till the end as a mystery if we have time. But I want to concentrate on three of the, of the others. One of them 
Um, uh, where am I now? Yeah. One of them is uh, one that we've actually gotten rid of. It's been eradicated completely. And it's interesting because the method to avoid it caught on very, very quickly, very, very quickly, and spread throughout the, the Western world very, very quickly, except in Montreal, which I'll explain. Uh, but it's out of the way now. In another, a researcher used a lot of big data and some small data to figure out the way it spread and how it could be stopped. And he got his evidence by studying people in their natural habitat without experimenting on them. But he also used a lot of outside the box sort of and first principles thinking and an awful lot of shoe leather. And I'll explain later what shoe leather epidemiology is. And most importantly, like a lot of people have said, chance favors the prepared mind. And that was a big piece of him getting it right as well. But it took a lot longer for his evidence to be turned into knowledge and into public health practice. And then, lastly, I will move on to some epidemiology, epidemiology history that many of you have lived through. And I'll show you the kind of population research tools that we use today. And then I'll close by revisiting the polio trials, uh, which is really a triumph of rigor and big data over the polio disease that I've circled. And I think, we, as I say, we need a little bit of good, uh, you know, a good story to end with. So I will start then with this one, which I say, why am I talking about that? Well, you'll see why, I hope. Uh, it's now gone, but this is what it looked like. It was a horrible disease. It killed people in huge numbers. But very interestingly, about 10 centuries ago already, people had figured out how to avoid it or how to make people immune. If they could take some, they could inoculate susceptible individuals with material taken directly from these postules. They would take the disease from here and rub it on the skin, and they were doing that 10 centuries ago. And if it didn't kill them, but there was a, high, a little risk of that, it would protect them for life. But with all the improvements over the century, it was still quite dangerous to inoculate them and for other people who would be nearby and that could get uh, infected. And it took time to get it right. <coughs> and so this is what it looked like if, if, if it worked. You would have a very, very severe reaction in your arm, but if you recover, then you are immune from life. This is taken directly from the disease of another person, something we're thinking of doing now with serum in Ebola. Uh, <coughs> Interestingly, though, in the late, and this is where observation helps. Uh, in the late 1700s, dairy farming people in the southwest of England noticed something unusual. The milkmaids, who milked the cows and other workers as well, who had dealt with them, if they, could, uh, if they contracted cowpox, which is a milder version of the thing, from handling cows others, and they would usually get it through a break in their, in their skin, they would then be immune to smallpox forever after, for, for the rest of their life. So the, such people were in huge demand as nurses to the smallpox patients. Uh, and so they didn't, uh, yeah. So a farmer decided to try and give his wife and two eldest sons immunity by infecting them directly from the cow. He took them to an infected cow at a farm six miles away. He used the darning needle to transfer the postular material from the cow directly onto their arms. The two boys had mild reactions and recovered quickly. His wife's arm got very inflamed, and uh, she almost died, but she recovered. And so it gave them protection against the smallpox, but the neighbors were absolutely appalled that you would transfer disease from an animal to a human. So it didn't catch on, it wasn't publicized, and so on, and it wasn't taken up. But 20 years later, a country doctor, also a naturalist, as you're going to see from his diagrams, uh, he decided to inoculate a young boy, not directly from the cow, but from this material here. Here, this material from the girl. This is, she has smallpox that she got from milking the cows. This is from a scratch that she had, and it went in there and infected there. So he's going to take material from that. That is his illustration. He was a naturalist as well. His illustration. So water in my bag there. And it injected directly into the arm. 
So he did that, and this is the first recorded. Now, we didn't have uh, iPhones to record this, but, uh, and we had painters who used their imagination later on to, to redo it. And this is supposedly Dr. Jenner giving the vaccine. For the, yes, and indeed, it is a vaccine. It's through the milkmaid, but from the vaca, the cow, directly into the arm of the, uh, thank you, of the, of the eight-year-old boy. And uh, he did well. And then, that was in May, in uh, July, they challenged him with the real thing, with the real smallpox. Challenged him by taking the material directly from a smallpox patient, but he was looked protected. He did it a second time, and any of you young scientists in the audience must be wondering, is that all you need to do now to go ahead before uh, you go to... He vaccinated his own son. He's, he looks different in this picture, so these are drawings after the fact. But again, this worked. And you see the difference. This is what many of you have here on the right-hand side. You see what many of you have in your arm. I see you checking now. Yeah. That's what many of us have. I think the young people don't have it because I think it's been stopped at this point. But, as I say, I mentioned Montreal. Uh, I'm going to show here some trouble in Montreal. Two things. Trouble because the disease broke out and the public got out of control as well. And here's this illustration where a large segment of the population was afraid of the vaccine. There had been some bad reactions in a previous batch and one particular doctor was also very anti-vaccination and he opposed quarantine and other public health measures as well. And that's September of 1885, 4,000 Montrealers died. It's the last urban outbreak in Montreal, in, in uh, North America, and it's the subject of an excellent uh, National Film Board movie, and I've put the link to that on my website. That's going to be available to you if you look later on in your slides, you'll see, in your um, material, you'll see it. So it's a fantastic movie to, to look at. But obviously the message is, if this is the case and we oppose vaccines here, that opposing the other vaccines may lead to the same trouble and is starting to lead to the same trouble. So that's the relevance of this. This is almost one of the last cases in the world. Uh, it took a very concerted effort by the WHO to rid it from Asia and Africa, and they finally succeeded. This is near the end. I won't stay long at it. But they uh, eliminated it in um, 1977, 37 years ago since the last case of uh, polio. Smallpox, smallpox, sorry. Good, I'm glad you're away. Thank you. Yeah, too many, too many diseases. Okay, so quickly, cholera. Cholera, we have to tell the story if we're in epidemiology. We just have to tell the story of cholera because it's our poster child uh, for how to do things well and how to use big data, but how to use them imaginatively and how to keep going even when your critics say otherwise. This was another horrible disease. Uh, and again, had this, uh, this history of you could be well this morning and dead by tonight, this sort of thing. That was uh, during the second pandemic, which reached Europe, and it actually reached Montreal in 19, 1832 as well. So what were the ideas as to how it was spread? Well, the first one, the usual one, and the one people should think of first, is direct person-to-person -person contact. Those people were called the contagionists in their theory. But the much more dominant one was the miasma theory. The miasma theory was the one that said it's from uh, rotting vegetative uh, um, organic material. It's vapors, exhalations, it's something wrong, the atmosphere is poisoned or polluted. And it's all about smell and stench. And the same thing with bad air for malaria, I think, was the same thing. So this is what they thought, that the disease was from an invisible and otherwise undetectable emanation, they called it, from rotting organic material. And, of course, it would be then found in low-lying areas very much. Um, okay. Well, this is the second time cholera came to England. It came in 1832. It came again with a vengeance. This is the worst of the four epidemics that England had. And you're going to see now one of the first epidemic curves. We're seeing them in our newspapers these days again. But they're usually written cumulatively in our... The, the graph has continued to go up. 
It's, not, it's adding all the cases. Normally, an epidemic curve shows only the cases each day. So you hope it will fall at some point. And here's the epidemic for England in 1849. 50,000 people died in England. And then we're talking about a population less than the size of Ontario and Quebec combined. 50,000 over 1,000 a day for several days in September of that year. And everything was about the air. They were running around with lime trying to disinfect people and so on. But in fact, uh, they were on the wrong track. And that's when this man said, it's not uh, bad air, it's waterborne, it's the fecal oral, oral fecal route, uh, just like the polio is, and, uh, and it's tra it can be uh, transmitted through or communicated through water or helped along to spread. It can also, of course, uh, stay on clothes, of soiled uh, clothes, and uh, on fruit and stuff like that and be passed directly as well. But the most common, fast way to get it anywhere is through water. And that's what causes the big outbreaks because it'll poison a lot of people at once rather than one by one. So John Snow is not the John Snow that your children are watching now, or your grandchildren are watching in one of those TV series. He was a, a very uh, prominent, uh, raised, you know, rose from very humble origins in England but became very prominent, so much so that he gave anesthesia to Queen Victoria for two of her children. He introduced anesthesia to England, made it practical and safe and scientific. But he's equally loved by epidemiologists, and his is the first work we introduce our epidemiology students to, this particular story. So his first pamphlet, and again, in those days, if you had money, and he had money that he, from professional earnings, he published his own stuff. He didn't wait to be rejected by five journals. He said, I'm going to just publish myself, because his critics were pretty rough at that point. And so he basically said, this is what it is. And he had reasoned it out from examples, from first principles, from a whole lot of different logic, and a number of very small episodes of poisoned water, then uh, from cholera victims, then getting re uh, brought into the drinking water again. And he's one of the first I know to have said that we should boil the water and filter the water. So these boil water ideas, I can't go back further. They, they were boiling it, but not for killing germs like this. He knew this would should kill the germs. And he also say, pointed out something very important, that even when the water was contaminated, it looked okay and it tasted okay. So that was a huge problem. It looked okay, it tasted okay. So that was, that was a big thing. That, uh, and people would, yeah. So Anyway, what did he do? He waited for the next epidemic now because he got a hold of a bit of information. And the information was that whereas most of the water companies in London would divide up, just like Videotron and Bell and Telus do today, divide up the territory so they're not in competition. That makes it easier. But in South London, two of the companies were in competition with each other. The Southwark Company and the Lambeth Company. We're in competition, and you see this area in the middle here where there's actually an overlap, where both of them are selling water to their customers through the pipes. Why is that critical? Because the big argument will be you cannot compare one area with another, one water company, because that would be like comparing Westmount and St. Lambert, or St. Henry and uh, somewhere else, right? You, you know, there's too many other things different between them. So uh, we want everything else to be the same. That's like the lab people say. We want everything else to be the same except the water. It's the same elevation, the same population density, the same poverty levels, the same this, the same that. So this gave them a chance with pipes going down the same street, and they hardly knew who was getting what. Uh, so you can ask me that later. How come? They didn't know who they were getting their water from. And so he waited his chance on this. So he was waiting, in a way, for the next epidemic to come so that he could see what was going on. But the problem was that this company here was taking its water from around here. And this company here, the Salmon Common one, was from slightly, this is the House of Parliament, so they were taking it from slightly further down the river, so only slightly worse, but just as awful. These are, this, the, the company is taking the water directly and not always filtering it very well, directly and selling it to you as uh, drinking water. So before, let's, he didn't have long to wait. In 1854, the next epidemic came. But let's look at what was happening. Oh, yeah, one last thing I had to tell you is that the government was on to the water companies, or after them, I should say, to move their water intake upstream to be in cleaner water, to be taking cleaner water. It'd be like saying, 
take your water from Hudson, not from downtown. Our, our St. Lambert water comes from the downtown river here. So take it from upriver where it would be cleaner and where, well, yeah, where the stuff wouldn't go into it. So, but first, at the moment, in, 19, in 1848, they were still both taken from downtown dirty water. And this area here had slightly lower rates than this one. But this area in the middle here was very, very bad. I expect because it was the most crowded part of the city and there were a lot of other things going on. So you couldn't really tell much from that. Uh, but then wait till you see the next epidemic. Now, at the next epidemic, these, this company has now moved its water, its water intake up to just south of Heathrow Airport in the country, south of Heathrow Airport, uh, still on the River Thames. And look what happened. Well, in this area that hadn't changed its water intake, things got a little worse because the epidemic was worse that year. This mixed area here now, this, these guys now have some of their customers getting good water and some getting poor water, so it went down. And this group now, who is getting water from up near Heathrow Airport now, had almost no cholera. Are you convinced? Huh? Would you go after your company now to say you have to switch right away? Well, his critics said, no, 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 he's full of, there's full of objections to this. And 101 different EPI 101 objections as to why this is. Um, he had one other piece of information, oh sorry, one other thing he did, he couldn't tell from these data, from the government, who was actually getting water from the companies and who was getting water from the drains or the ditches or the river. Because all he knows here, this is an area served by these companies. He doesn't know of those who died where they were getting their water. So this is where the shoe leather comes in. He decided, he went to the government office, got the list of the deaths, and the addresses of the people who died and went, they say by foot, but I suspect by carriage, to South London and then knocked on each door where there had been a death and determined, and again I'll, ask, I'll t tell you later about that, how he figured out which company they were getting their water from. So he knew which water they were drinking before they got sick. Was it from the one company or the other company or from the drains? And here's what he found. Now, in the area that was now getting the clean water, versus the one that was still getting the dirty water. And these are customers now. They're not areas, these are customers. There was a 13 to 1 ratio of deaths in the two. This was in the first four weeks. So he went to every one of these houses personally or with another doctor to do this. This is why he was so admired for what we call shoe leather epidemiology. Although I don't think he had time to, to do at all by shoe. Some of it was by, he was well healed at this point. I think uh, some of it was by uh, carriage. But, as I say, even with these two pieces of information, he, I'm not sure the critics they would have to, had a tough time with him still. He got, he got, I shouldn't say lucky here, because 600 people were very unlucky and died in an outbreak in, in the other side of the river in central London. In an area about the size, less than the size of McGill, m much smaller than the size of McGill, 600 people died of an outbreak, a single outbreak, in about 10 days. This is way more, actually only 400 died in the whole season in South London in the, in the, in the lowest area. So this is a horrible, one of the worst outbreaks ever in history of this uh, in about 10 days. So something, there must have been some point source that was causing it. He lived right near there, interrupted his shoe leather epidemiology and went back to question them as to what was going on. I have to cut the story short, but the main point is you see here, a pump called the Broad Street Pump that he suspected of being the culprit here. Each dot here is one death. You don't see all 600, but most of them. And I think about three quarters of them definitely had been drinking from water from that pump. It, apparently people came from everywhere. To, that pump had the sweetest water. And people would come from the air rather than go to the other ones that were closer. But there were three very important exceptions that sort of helped the case more because some of the miasma people say, oh, there's something bad, bad factory, bad something, bad smell somewhere. That could explain it. One other guy said, look, if the cholera broke out anywhere in London, it would have to be near some pump. So this doesn't prove anything. That's a smart scientific thing to say, but and it's hard, to, it's hard to have a comeback against it. So he said, okay, but then explain me these three exceptions. You see this blank area here? Uh, where is it? Here, I think. 
There's one blank, one block with nothing, with no collar in it. Why is that? There it is. Yeah, good. You've got better eyes than me. That whole block, there's no collar in it. Why is that? It's not a park. No, there's lots of people there. Lots of people working there. It's a brewery. <laughs> they have their own beer and they have their own well on site. No problem. Yeah. Secondly, there's 500 people at a workhouse here, at a poor house here, workhouse, working, and only three people in the whole workhouse die. Why there? They had their own supply. But the clincher, the absolute clincher for me anyway, is the case of the, woman, the widow from Hampstead. She used to live near Broad Street and loved the water there. She moved away upscale to Hampstead, and, uh, but she still liked the water so much she had her sons, who still lived here, send her water every two days by cart. They sent her some water on the Thursday. She and her niece were dead in Hampstead on Saturday. Okay? So now you miasma people explain that, how it picked her out and nobody else. So to me, that's the, 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 the smoking gun in the whole thing. But still the critics were upset. They said, you haven't proved the thing was, was uh, contaminated, the well was contaminated. And this is a piece that's not well known, but in fact is very well told in a fairly recent book called The Ghost Map by Stephen Johnson. I've put that link also in the sheet I've put in your, in your uh, thing. It's a great book and uh, well worth reading. And this local curate is a bit of a hero in it as well because he found what today we call an epidemiology index case, first case, CNN calls patient zero. I heard them at it last week, patient zero. Uh, but that's the one in Texas, yeah. So uh, this is the guy, a little older. There was no Facebook at that time, so they didn't have a good picture of him. Uh, but here's, here's the point. He figured out this case. He was actually very sus suspicious about it when Jon Snow published his book and gave it to him. He said, no, no, he believed the miasma theory. He had had water from that pump with his brandy one night. He saw people survive because they drank lots of water from that pump. So he was very skeptical at the beginning, but after about four months of legwork, doing a lot of questioning of the locals in his area, he had to come around to it so much so that he finally then stumbled on something he'd been missing. He, because th this infant died at 40 Broad Street, which was just outside, sorry, the pump was outside her front door. And what's the story? She died on day three, and that's all he'd been paying attention to because she was a child, and he probably died very quickly. So she couldn't be case number zero, or case one. But then about four months later, he realized, or six months later, he realized, re reading his notes again, that in fact she had had the di diarrhea uncharacteristically for four days. Not one day normally, but four days. So now that's in day minus one. So she could now be the first case. So, and because her, the pump was right outside her door, they went to talk to the mother and look at the story. It was called nappies in the English version of it, napkins, but it's soiled diapers steeped in water, and then the water from the pail was poured into a cesspool. The cesspool was blocked and defective. The brickwork was falling apart. The cesspool was draining into a drain. The brickwork was a mess. And all of this was less than three feet from the well the, where the pump was drawing its water from. So that's the closest we can get, and that's why uh, that was not Snow's work. This is this curate. MA from Oxford. Uh, yeah, so that's what it was. And the engineer who excavated said, yes, it's still moist six months later. It's still seeping into the well. So that's a pretty impressive piece of data. With all of this, the government statisticians took two and a half years to make their report and said, no, we don't believe a word of it. It's some product of a rotting organic matter. Twelve years later, poor Snow was dead by this time for several years. He died at 45. Uh, cholera returns, and the government statisticians had always been doing weekly reports of deaths and causes of deaths. So they were on top of things pretty fast, and the government statisticians noted very, very quickly that, in fact, uh, there was a, an outbreak starting in South London, in East London. And moreover, they knew exactly where the companies were selling their water, and that 90% of the deaths were in an area served by one water company, the East Water Company, East London Water Company. And uh, 
they nailed them on it. They actually put up notices right away saying this is what's going on. The company denied it, but, later, but lied, and later were found out in a parliamentary report that in fact they had been selling unfiltered water to people, supplying unfiltered water to people. So this is the first notice I've seen of boil water and the word cholera and water side by side in the same thing. So it's starting to get into people's mind. And here's another one that says the same thing. But it took really until 1883 of uh, Robert Koch, the microbiologist in Germany, who also discovered the bacillus for TB and a number of other things. He's the one who finally could see it under the microscope and then that led a big impetus then up into the 1900s to, chlor to chlorinate water against typhoid and cholera. And that's when public health really got very, very serious. So now into the 20th century. We'll take a breather for a minute. But uh, the cholera story is a bit unusual for you because it's, uh, as I said, it's, it's not anything you see today. It's still around. Doesn't need much to, um, when a person is sick, except rehydration. But uh, sanitation is a big piece of it. Okay, so in the 20th century, I'm going to start with birth defects and the epidemiology of birth defects. Why? Because the, the trail between whatever you're exposed to and ever what you come down with is fairly short. I'm then going to widen the time so that it becomes harder and harder to go back further and further and find out what was the culprit. But birth defects are especially interesting because there's a very focus on what was going on usually in the nine months of pregnancy. What is it that I was taking that caused this defect in this child? So I will start with a few. And um, in fact, here the names for these now were there's cataracts in the eyes and, and, uh, and uh, being born deaf and also some heart problems. But being born deaf or cataracts in the eyes, what do you think we're talking about? And I'm talking here 1941 in Sydney, Australia is the first time this was figured out. So babies are coming, going to an ophthalmologist, being brought in with cataracts, strange things over the eyes. As soon as they're born, they can see it. Then later on, they found out that there was a huge epidemic of deafness as well, being born deaf and other serious complications with that. You are taking this for granted today, and I think that's the problem, is people don't know their history, so they don't know why we should worry about this. Your, your grandchildren, your children, what is it? Any, any offers? Huh? Rubella, German measles. German measles, yeah, rubella. Yeah. And the counterbalance, we actually had to wait until 1969 for vaccination. And in fact, uh, and then 1971 for MMR. And in fact, uh, there was a huge outbreak in North America in 1964 that some of you, my wife remembers it uh, here, uh, 12 million people had German measles in 1964 and about 20,000 babies were born deformed in the next year because of that in North America. So uh, with no vaccine at the time. So they were telling people at the time what were you told, your mother's told to tell you to do? If you got it as a six-year-old, go have a party and give it to the other six-year-old girls, right? You had the rubella party. Yeah, exactly. No, seriously, it wasn't a bad system. It wasn't a bad system at all. Uh, the next one, 1961, thalidomide, an awful disaster, but finally got the FDA to be serious about testing of drugs in pregnant women. They were typically not tested in pregnant women because, oh, well, they should be excluded. Well, uh, so on. But obviously pregnant rats would be better than pregnant women to test it on first. Uh, that's one. Now, the other one, 65, I've even forgotten what this is myself. Oh, yes, that's right, exactly. And here we're talking about being low in folic acid or, or that. And now the good thing is, since 1995 in the US and Canada, if you look at the label on your bread, and on your flour, I think, you're going to see that it has folic acid in it, and that has reduced considerably. It's another success story. Um, and again, you see what I mean? When things fall and things are doing well, public health is not in the picture. They're behind, right? It's when things are going wrong and public health is in the picture. When they're going right, they're not there. 
Okay, I move a little further on now because this is getting, going to get harder now to see the links. Well, polio, you saw in the video, people didn't know what it was. They, some did, some didn't. They were afraid of everything, and fear was huge at that time. My mother was uh, burning the brown paper wrappings that would come on parcels from the city. I remember that in the 90, early 1950s. You remember similar panic cases here. Yeah, and the countermeasures of vaccination. I'll end with that story at the end of the video. Caries is another very interesting one. Caries builds up over several years. What, now we're talking about something protective. Fluoride, we know today, is the protective. What did they, how did they figure that out? They actually saw that in mining communities in Colorado, and mostly in mining communities, that the kids actually, their teeth were very good, although they were over, overly black. They were so good that they were black. And they thought at one point that... Um, it was copper or some other thing in the water. It took them a long time with some experiments on rats and so on. And then they went to different communities that had natural amounts of fluoride in the water to figure out that it was fluoride, was the, the active ingredient in preventing caries. But very interestingly then, there were three very interesting trials in New York State, in Michigan, and in uh, Ontario to prove that putting it in the community water would, would make a difference, and it did. This one is another horrible story that many of you know of. I'll come back to this one again. Adulthood, I'm not even going to go there. It's just too long a list and too many confusing things. Right? We just pick your, what you're afraid of. You know. It just goes on and on. And I say, the, the list, you see, now we can go back 60, 70, 80 years into, in utero. What were we exposed to? What when we were young? We are starting to study the young ones, and we'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But it's a long haul to find all these. Right, what are some of the tools? I've sort of mentioned the epidemiologist toolbox already, but this is the first one. This is the letter. Uh, this is actually in the, uh, the uh, not the letter, the, the publication in the, uh, from the Ophthalmology Journal in Australia. For some reason, the Lancet didn't believe him and wanted more data. Uh, look what's happening. He has 78 cases, and in all the 10, there's a history of infection with the rubella in the first trimester. And probably even those 10 had it and didn't know. It's not even clear. Yeah. Uh, so this, and I think around a dozen of these were his own cases, and then he collected others, he wrote others, and got them. So this would be called today either the single case report or the multiple case report. And are you convinced by this? Of course, today you are, because you know the answer. But would you have been convinced at the time? Hmm? Probably. Well, lots of people weren't. It took a while. Another guy helped him out enormously with the deaf cases, because they were actually easier. He could go back in the census, and they'd been counting how many deaf people were, and he could see after every epidemic in Australia, there were loads of extra deaf people born. So it helped hugely to get that. And uh, yeah, the thalidomide one. So this was case reports. What's this? This is a comparison. Normally you wouldn't have more than this number, percent of babies with, con and that's even taking a very mild cases. It would be less than that if you're talking zero. But in the first months that he was talking about, one in five of the women taking thalidomide was having serious problems with the babies. It, it was again something that hit you so quickly. Um, this one is interesting because if I told you here in the uh, one with the folic acid, they looked at the mothers who had given birth to a, a, a child with, with neural tube defects and they found that two-thirds of them were lacking something. There was some deficiency in the processing or the metabolism of folic, uh, folate. So what would that mean to you? It sounds suspicious that we're on to something here, but you wouldn't really know because you wouldn't know in normal babies or in mothers of normal babies or in the population in general what percent of them would have it as well. So that's why he had to have the mothers of normal infants here because it was 65% of the affected babies, their mothers had this problem, but one in six of these. So that was a pretty big difference. The one thing he couldn't be sure of here was it was it the deficiency or was it the... Um, defective metabolism. It could be, sorry, uh, you know, you're not getting enough intake, or it could be that, and it took a long time, in fact, with a lot of trials of high-risk mothers then,
to this, to, in, a, in a randomized trials where some would get supplements, some wouldn't, to show that the supplements work. And they are the main basis now for our uh, folic acid in the flour. But that had to go to trial because it was very complicated. And you're do we're all taking folic acid now. So you see, the danger now is that giving it to everybody means the risks can't be big or we'll do more harm than good again. How are we doing for time? Okay, yeah. This is another uh, one. This now, the time scale is getting longer and longer here. Because here we're talking about women, sorry, giving, sorry, be, uh, young women developing cancer in the late 60s, 66 to 69. They were about 20 years of age, so their mother was pregnant with them in 1946 to 51, so about 20 years before. Now we're trying to go back and see what it was. Of course, they tell you the answer here in this, but there were a lot of suspects at the time. And if I told you that there were eight cases of this, and they questioned the mothers about what they were doing 20 years ago when they, before they were, when they were pregnant with this woman. If I told you that seven of the eight women had been smoking during pregnancy, what would you think? You wouldn't believe it? Or, well, maybe that's what's causing this. Right? You'd think that's causing that. So, 90% of accidents occur within 10 kilometers of home. Does that mean you should move? <laughs> Most of our time is spent near home too, right? So, this is the same issue here. The first thing you've got to do is get other people as well who don't have, you know, are from the general population of mothers and look at what smoking like it was in those times. Tell me how, back in the 1940s, anyone here from that time? Your mothers here from that time? Yeah? How many of them would have been smoking? Okay, maternal smoking. Seven of the eight cases, 21 of the 32 controls. Two-thirds of the mothers were smoking. Yeah. Uh, there, there were other suspects here. There was... Uh, some pregnancy loss here in some of these, but not as many of the controls. There was bleeding in a number of cases. What do you think it was like for, uh, maybe it was radiation that they had when they were pregnant, x-rays. How many of the women would have had x-rays? One of the eight cases, four of the 32 controls, x-rays in the late 1940s. Wouldn't have go near that today. Breastfeeding. Oh, well, we're on to it now, here. Three out of eight, three out of eight, that's not enough. That's why they're not, bre that's why, it's because they're not breastfeeding. I was amazed at this number. I was born at that time myself, 1947, and I was breastfeeding. So I don't know what's, this is North America though, I was in Ireland. Uh, <laughs> there, was, there was much other food. Um, but look, look at the swing, look at the swing. In, from no breastfeeding then, it was the opposite now practically. Yeah. But, but the clincher again and the smoking gun here was seven of the eight cases, and we even suspect the eighth case had, had DES during pregnancy. And I think it's in high risk women that they were doing it to prevent, I think, the loss, if I'm not mistaken, and none of the others. It was all in one hospital too. They're, they were lucky here that there was one hospital of treating high risk women. So, it's a horrible story, but the interesting thing, I, I like this teaching one because it's so small and so convincing. But you're talking about going back 20 years to get history, and memory is very tough to do at this point. And these people, when you question them, are not that motivated to remember back 30 years ago or 20 years ago. They, first of all, they're saying, I don't have the problem. Why are you studying me? Why are you asking me? And not realizing you have to ask the others to, to know what's normal before you can say what's abnormal. And if we had wanted blood or something like that from them back then, we couldn't get it. You know, it's too late. The, the chance is gone. So that's why I'm coming on to the, the studies of the present now, that the longer the time scale you are, you often, often have to start at the beginning and get the blood, get the information at the beginning before things happen. Because it's just too hard to do it the other way around. Things are too far in advance and the history will be faulty, and so on. If we have computers, yes, maybe, we'll be able to go back and get histories, but you won't get some of the important information that's missing. So, um, 
Yeah, so this is the probably most famous cohort or a longitudinal study where you start at the beginning and people follow people forward. Framingham, Massachusetts, 5,000 people were uh, selected at random and then they're almost all gone now, all of these ones, but they're following up their offspring and their offspring's offspring, right? But this is the study that has told us about cholesterol, about blood pressure, about smoking, and the risks for heart disease. This is the study still that people look to, and your doctor may even use the word the Framingham risk score, which says depending on what you're doing and your blood levels and so on, what you risk in the next five or ten years is of heart disease. So it's the bedrock of, of uh, heart disease epidemiology. Very interestingly, in 1948, we got the data from them for some of it, and half the data, they were examined every two years, and blood was taken and all sorts of extra exams and so on. But in the first exam, only half of them have a cholesterol value. And we said, why are they missing? Well, they didn't even think it was important enough in 1948 to put cholesterol in. And it was only halfway through the first exam that they thought, oh, we better measure cholesterol. And they did. The next one, very big study that you hear a lot about nowadays, I started out interested in oral contraceptives, but then expanded to heart disease, osteoporosis, all sorts of things. Uh, it has 100,000 nurses in it and a good group to study because they're very uh, good about record keeping and filling out things and they know the medicine as well. But again, you're doing all this laying down the documentation of the data before you come to the, uh, to the events. And you can study many different things now if you have it. The one thing, though, I have to say in a little bit of caution here is that they're the ones who I think... Uh, along with another one. There, this is where we got it wrong a little bit in epidemiology and got some egg on our face. They're the ones who uh, said, oh yes, uh, taking hormone replacement therapy, not just for the symptoms of menopause, but it's good for the heart. They had been pushing this has been good for the heart, so had another non-experimental study earlier on, and they got that wrong, as best the clinical trials showed later that they were wrong, that some of the things... There were more harms than good being done by hormone replacement therapy being taken long term for things beyond the menopause. So that's why you have in the website, I have the article here by Tobes, who's a bit of a skeptic, a very, very good science writer with the New York Times, fantastic epidemiologist, even though he's, he's a science writer, he's learned it all himself, and well worth reading this about don't believe everything you hear from epidemiologists. Our journalists. Well, epidemiologists make the trouble too, yeah, themselves. This is a close-to-home uh, longitudinal study. Some of you may well be in this because Montreal is in this as one of the centers, and one of our epidemiologists, Christina Wolfson, is the, one of the co-principal investigators of this across Canada. Uh, here's another co-principal investigator here for another study that's starting at the, with the kids at age eight and following a cohort of children at age eight. God knows how long, well after our time, Jill. So, uh, yeah, so these are longitudinal studies. The other thing here is you often will put the blood in the bank and you have it for whatever comes up later. You'll even have it for new genetic tests and things later on if you collect it now, even for factors we don't know about yet. So those are the advantages of the present one. Just, yeah, I have a few minutes. I want to move ahead to next year now, move into the future and uh, ask the question, um, how much evidence do you think there is for the MUHC's decision to have all single beds, single rooms in the new MUHC? If that's still the case. I've heard rumors that it mightn't be, but so far people are telling me it's all single rooms. What's the basis for that? Comfort, privacy, cutting down on infections, cutting down on infections. In fact, at one point I'd heard somebody in Montreal say, why do we have two super hospitals in Montreal? Wouldn't one be enough? And somebody smartly said, well, what if there's an infection somewhere or an epidemic? I'd rather have it cut it in two by having two hospitals and protect half of them. Um, in any case, yeah, so we were, looking at, we were looking at the ICU, because that's a place where lots of infections happen, and we just, it was the, the highest risk place. And so we actually got a chance to look at this question, because the mon but let me change this from the journalese to, uh, to the way I like to put it. What, how, what happened to infection rates when the Montreal General switched 
to all private rooms in their intensive care. Before that, there had been one big room where the nurse is managing several patients all around in a circle. All right. so, so you could study that. We had 28 months beforehand and 52 months, about six years altogether, 28 months before they switched over to private and then more after. But that's a pretty rough comparison to make and lots of other factors could have come in in the meantime and they did. C. difficile came in and messed everything up just to make life complicated for us. But we were very lucky, a bit like John Snow, and we jumped on the chance. And that was that the Royal Victoria didn't change at that time. They continued over the same period of six years with multi-bed rooms. So we have a chance now to see did things do better. And you know, those of you who have been there, the Montreal General is a much rough, uh, higher, they have higher risk patients in general. So we compared the ICU before and after in the Montreal General and then used the Royal Victoria where things didn't change. They have the same chief of infectious diseases, the same policies, they use the same sanitizers, the same schedule, the same everything, so they say. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to show you here three different series, three different things. So just take the top one first and I'll show you what it is. This is the ratio of the infection rates in the Montreal General to the VIC. So they're higher in the Montreal General than the VIC. It's about three to, two to one because of the sicker patients typically in the ICU. Right? The blue, not the blue, the red dots are the uh, dots bef in the months before the changeover and the green are after the changeover. Right? So you would hope if things got better over there that things will go below the, can you see the gray line there? Yeah, the gray line, yeah. So that's, uh, so my eye test, and I'm a statistician, and we have lots of statistical tools for deciding whether there's been a change or not, whether you believe it. But I don't, this was such a high stakes issue that I went around with this graph to many colleagues. I think is Madhu here. Uh, did I check you? Yes. Yeah, I think you were one of them. And I, he, I wouldn't tell him or any of the other colleagues what I was doing here. I said, there's three different series here, but they're all before and after. Do you see any change? So I'm asking you again all of you now, do you see a change in the top series? And then do you see a change in this series and a change in this series? They're three different things. So what's the, the vote? What do people think here? Huh? Yes on one? Is that what I heard? You're saying you think you see a change in number one? Although it's very jumpy. It's very jumpy, but that's the nature of infectious diseases. It's jumpy. Right? We're talking here about 19,000 patients and I think 58,000 person days in the ICU of the two hospitals. 19,000 admissions, I think I figured out. Yeah, and 85,000 days. So even with that, it's dice, it's jumpy. So most people told me that they could sort of see something here, but they wouldn't swear to it and put a lot of money on it. Right? Because you had some months where it was worse, but that's the case. This one? Eh. Yeah. And the same? Eh. Yeah. That was what I heard, meh, yeah, as my kids would say. Yeah, so no, nothing there. Well, the reason we had done it this way, and this is important, is that the top graph would be the bugs that you would expect to change in. And the middle bra group would be the bugs you shouldn't expect to change in. They would have nothing to do with the, uh, that. I think the microbiologist explained to me what that is. So these we wouldn't expect to, be, to change, and they didn't. And this is the length of stay, which didn't get changed very much, because there's lots of other things going on. So in the paper, we put it a little more easy for people's eye here, so you could see a bit of a change in the bugs that matter. No change, tiny change here, nothing, random, and pretty well small change in length of stay, but pretty variable. And then this is what we said at the end. We said... Uh, substantial. Uh, that's the first author who said that. I'm not sure if I agreed entirely with her. It's a bit dicey the more I look at it. But the, uh, at this point, the MHC had decided what they were doing, but, and they were happy, of course, that it came this way. And of course, next year, when we do move this now, they're going to tell you the infection rates are down to zero there. <laughs> and I'm asking for how long? And uh, all of you next year will say, when they publish that, you're going to be much more skeptical skeptical about what else it could be. And we're not going to have to come back in 20 years and see was it, was it worth it. Um, okay, I want to finish with the last public health, the pu biggest public health experiment, which you started seeing at the beginning. That was the polio trial of 1954. Very interesting trial. 
First of all, why was polio so scary? Because of these sorts of numbers. In 1952, they had 60,000 cases of U polio in the US. It absolutely freaked everyone out. And of course, Roosevelt and them had the March of Dimes thing going, but there was a huge debate about the design of the trial. And the reason was this, that the March of Dimes wanted this study here, this design. They wanted to vaccinate grade two and keep grades three and one as controls. Oh yeah, come on, the, the, the supply sock is running desperate to try and make enough vaccine for this, so you have to do some rationing. So, you're going to object? Well, that was their favorite one, and that's why in the video you see when, when Thomas Francis came in, the epidemiologist from Michigan, said, no way, I'm only taking this job on if I'm allowed also to have in the other areas, other states, to have a placebo-controlled one. Where here, the people who refuse are out of it, and then the rest of them are randomized, and they'll either get a placebo, which looks to the kid and to the doctor and to everybody the same. Nobody will know until April of the next year when he opens the code who's getting what. Highly, highly rigorous. And there were problems with this. Now, do I have time to show you the last video? Yeah, I do. I'll give you the story from there, and then we'll stop. Now, how do I do that? You're going to have to tell me how I go back and get the, uh, the results. Okay. are employed, the vaccine could be considered to have been 60 to 80 percent effective against paralytic poliomyelitis. I accept this report gladly. Mr. Joyous occasion. Newspapers used typefaces that they hadn't used since World War II and frankly hadn't used before World War II. This was the second time in history they used typefaces that large. In factories across the country, the PA system would announce that the polio vaccine worked, and auto workers in Detroit and garment workers in New York City wept openly. People sat around radios listening to the results as if it were a Rocky Marciano heavyweight fight. Fire signals went off. Church bells rang. And I think uh, Dad came home from work and, and said that it had been announced. That was a fabulous thing. I remember the announcement. I remember being thrilled by it. Jonas Salk became an instant hero, and Tommy Francis, his mentor, the man who had helped put all this together, became more of a bit player. Tommy Francis went back to his laboratory, went back to continuing a distinguished career, went back to his students, went back to being the same remarkable, hardworking professor that he always was. If anything, if, if there's any word that really uh, defines uh, Tommy Francis, it's solidity. Francis had the reputation of being one of the most rigorous uh, scientists in the field of epidemiology. I really am convinced that he was a genius. Not just smart, he was a genius. epidemics at some level are optional. That doesn't mean they're easy to conquer. That doesn't mean that, that countries or, or regions that suffer from them are somehow failing to stand up to them. What that does mean is that we as a species have shown we have the capability to control and conquer diseases when we choose to. So let me just finish my last slide. Then, yeah, so the takeaway messages are that the knowledge behind public health practice has been a major contributor to improved longevity and health. We're often out of the limelight, but I think we, we can have our share of the credit. Evidence that advances the technology or that knowledge is not easily obtained because we're dealing with humans. It takes smarts, big data, small data, time, brains. Nowadays, I would say we almost have too much data and not enough brains. And last, it takes time for the evidence to be translated into correct knowledge. And if there's a, if, uh, as the man said himself, if a nation puts its brains and its money behind something to do it, they can get it done. So I want to end on that positive note tonight. Thank you. Yeah.
understand it now. There's question period. Is that it? Yeah. Any questions for Dr. Henry? I think they're to be written out, isn't that it? Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah. Hi, Ryan. Oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the question, yes, certainly, I'm not going to answer questions I'm not an expert in, so some of these I have to leave. But only ones. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll ask the question. Very good. Okay. I'm the questioner. I'll ask the question. Sorry. Oops. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Well, a bunch of questions. Thank you. I have heard that John Snow told the authorities to remove the handle of the Broad Street pump, and that then the epidemic stopped. Is this just a myth? It's true, but not because of cause and effect. It did stop because most of the epidemic had run out, but most of the people had run away and fled to other areas and gone to families elsewhere in the city. That's one of the reasons it, it stopped. The other is the cholera had stopped in the pump as well, yeah, and so on. But yes, but the people who know their epidemiology well know that it's, it's a myth that, that that was the cause of the change. Lots of it epidemic stopped by themselves. Okay, thank you. Uh, I thought that Pasteur had a lot to do with developing the smallpox vaccine. Can you comment on Pasteur? He, and the he may. Oh, yes, indeed. In fact, we have the name vaccination today because of he vac for other things. But he decided to honor Jenner. Jenner had taken the vaccine, the, the material from the cow through the trial to the cow, from the cow to the trial to the. Uh, people, yeah, and that was vac for the cow, vaccinia, I think they call it, and Pasteur, to honor Jenner, said, let's call them all vaccinations, whether they're from cows or any other foreign material. So that was Pasteur's uh, tribute to Jenner. And pa yes, he was involved, I think, with rabies. Yeah. Uh, here's another one. How do epidemiologists study the Ebola outbreak? Uh, ah, yes. The same way your, your answer is, or my answer is the same as your answer there. I'm watching CNN, I'm watching CBC, I'm watching BBC, I'm reading carefully, I'm trying to stay away from fear and try and get the facts. It ain't easy. It ain't easy. I, I have no more comment than that. I, you'd have to ask the infectious disease people to comment on it. Unless you want to add something. Well, I think the, what, what, uh, what uh, epidemiologists and, and public health officers are doing in all uh, regions uh, of the world, and particularly in North America and in Canada and in each of our provinces, is first of all uh, developing a very rigorous uh, surveillance system to identify uh, cases, and once cases are identified, to identify potential contacts to try to uh, limit the, the spread of disease, and then uh, working with uh, healthcare workers in hospitals uh, to uh, uh, develop the, and implement the best uh, containment method for yeah. patients, if any, ever present to, yeah. to one of our hospitals. So it's a complex uh, yeah. system, but uh, public health experts and epidemiologists use the tools that were presented by Jim to uh, identify potential uh, uh, risks to the population, be it Ebola or other risks, as a matter of fact, yeah. uh, and uh, uh, develop methods to, to contain those, uh, those risks. Uh, could you talk about how the salt vaccine went to the Sabin oral vaccine? Yes, yes. There was a race between Sabin who wanted live vaccine and thought that was the only way to go, and Salk, uh, who had killed vaccine, which was safer. There were problems early on with the Sabin vaccine. Uh, and in North, I remember in the North, Northern Ireland some very disasters because it, it, when it was given to people, the oral fecal route worked and you could give it to your children and others and infect them, get it yourself and give it to others. We were all very happy. I, my sister got it, I remember, on a sugar cube, 
uh, later when they did change, but I remember the nurse telling her, my parents, you have to watch it and change your diaper carefully and be careful on sanitation and so on. It was a much riskier one. It was better, of course, and they moved to Sabin, and for many, many years, Sabin was the standard. They have now moved back. Why do you think they've moved back? And it's now Salk again, the killed one. Why do you think that? Because the risk now is bigger than the disease. Sabin risk is bigger than the risk of getting the, poli the uh, polio itself. The salt risk is lower, and so you see it's a trade-off between risk and benefit. And when the risk uh, is higher than the benefit, you don't do it. So that's the logic. Uh, here's one. When Public Works omits to advise us when work is being done on our local water mains and we drink the murky water, is there any risk of cholera? Or do we get something more benign? No, no, like no. Cholera has to be put into the water first. Cholera has to come into the water. The dejections from our evacuation snow, call them, from patients have to get into the water. You don't get cholera from dirty water itself. If I had time, I would show you there's a reservoir of cholera in Bangladesh in that area still, and every epidemic of all of them that started starts from there and comes from there across the country. But, yeah, it has to be imported. And, and the murkiness of the water no. says nothing about no, 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 its no. potential quality. This is what got them wrong in London, that they were talking about the dirty water, the stench, the rest of it. What Snow kept saying is there's got to be something in there, and it's the dejections of other cholera patients that starts it. So water by itself won't do anything. And in fact, in the stink of London, the great stink of London in 1858, it was so bad that the parliament people had to leave. They couldn't do their work because of the stench of London. And for years and years, Baselgate, who's another guy you have to watch his movie, it's on the his stuff, he built the sewers of London, and he did so because they wanted to get rid of the stench. Because the, the London River is tidal and goes back and forth, and it would take a dead horse three days to go down the river, <coughs> back and forth. So it was horrible, and they had a very hot summer in 1858, so bad that finally, Baselgate, who'd been turned down with his plans for the sewers every year, finally the sewers, the smell got so bad that in 19 days in the parliament, they passed the bill and said, build the damn thing. <laughs> and he did. But in those weeks that the stink was highest in London, mortality didn't change. The other public health guy at the time, Chadwick, the major reformer for, Chad for public health in London, who said it's all disease is smell, all smell is disease. That was his mantra. And he fell out with Snow over it, because Snow testified in one of the bills that, that stench will not kill you. And uh, that's why the obituary in the Lancet for Snow said he was a noted anesthesiologist. Nothing about his... Uh, uh, cholera work. Nothing. They apologized last year. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly late. Uh, was thalidomide approved in Canada? I think North I think America got off lightly. I th certainly the FDA, I think they avoided that bullet. No. Not completely? No. FDA in the US, I thought. Canada, was it? It was here? Yeah. Uh, you were the oh, judges of that. I wasn't here at the time. Yeah. Here's the last one here, Ebola, the ter determination that it was only transferred by bodily fluids and not airborne. How did, how did this come about? I don't know is the answer. Um, well, I uh, 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 nor do I specifically, but I suspect through a very uh, 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 the type of research that we were talking yes, about, yeah. epidemiologic research. Yeah. and. Uh, understanding through questionnaires or observations uh, who developed and who doesn't develop the disease. That's it. That's it, yeah. I mean, we're in the same sort of situation now when that nurse's dog was being put down. I'm going back to in London in the plague in 1860-something. Uh, they thought dogs and cats were spreading the plague. And so they had dogs, 60,000 dogs and cats put down in London only to find out in 19, 1895 or so, I think it's around the very end of the 19, uh, yeah, 1890s, 
that Yersinia, Yersinia persis, whatever it is, the, the, the bug that travels with the flea that stays on the rat's back, that guy, yeah, so it's the rats actually, and the fleas were spreading it, so they killed the cats instead. Uh, so I'm just saying this is the sort of thing. I was reminded of it last week when they were trying to decide whether a dog could spread it with saliva as well. I mm. suspect it could, but I don't know. There's no question? Any questions from the audience uh, that you would like to raise your hand for and ask before we stop? So make sure you go see the video, the, the um, Sewer King. One, it's on Netflix, fantastic movie. And see the NFB one. And next week, we should. Then you know what's coming next week: maternal child health. Yeah. So just before you, I will oh. let you go. Um, um, yeah. yeah, but I think it's getting late for most people. We had said we'd give a quiz, or a mystery, mystery solving one. But I, I have a feeling it's a little late, and people want to go, or if you want to stay. But huh? They want to see it. It's. It's on my own computer, it's not on this one, but I can tell you the story of it broadly without even the rest of the story, without the pictures. So we go back to just about the same year, 1847, 1845, in the Vienna General Hospital. A huge hospital, it had two maternity wards, Division One and Division Two. For many years, the doctors and the midwives trained together back and forth, and then there was an act of parliament that says the doctors have to be in one division and the midwife trainees in the other division. When that happened, and they split the division, so it was midwives in division two and doctors and student doctors as well in division one, the death rate from puerperal fever which is childbed fever, a fever you get after delivering, was 10% in Division 1, where the doctors were working, and 3% in Division 2, where the midwives were working. And a man named Ignaz Semmelweis became head of obstetrics at that hospital and saw this is terrible, we have to do something about it, we have to get to the bottom of it. The main theories at that time were miasmas. 1847 in Austria, no different than 1847 in Britain, or here, in Montreal. Although I had a feeling that the public knew more about it than the public health people, and that they knew enough to go away from things, and they didn't talk miasmas so much, I think they knew the contagion side of it. So he's wondering what could this be? I'm not telling you all the stories. You're going to have to ask me bits about it uh, as well. Um, I have to see if I have my crib sheet here of what, what they were myself. Um, they thought miasmas. No, no, it can't be that. It's the same. They're, they're separate from each other, the two wards, but it can't be that. Is Madhu here? He'll have to help me if this is the case. But the other thing he thought of it could be more crowding. It could be crowding. And he said, well, that can't be because, in fact, the women are begging to get into Division 2 to be delivered by the midwives. And, by the way, these were poor women whose baby was then going to be given away because why would you go into hospital to have a 1 in 10 chance of dying there of childbirth? It was because there were poor women or illegitimate babies that were going to be given away. And since one of the, record, one of the talks coming up soon is electronic medical records, the records keeping was, there would be several women to a bed often, but the electronic medical records there were, you wrote your name, you're not, you wrote your name, somebody wrote your name in an envelope and sealed it and put it on the window. So you were just called the patient in bed number something. You were never called by your name. So why would they put the sealed envelope in the window? And it was never used. It was never opened again. Unless, unless you died and they had to notify your family. So that's electronic medical records in Vienna in 1850. <laughs> Robin Tamlin will be talking about that in a few weeks. Um, where were we? The miasmas, the crowding. No, in fact, the crowding was worse in Division Two, where the midwives were, because the women noticed themselves. And the allocation to Division One or Division Two was by day. 
every second day or every second hour or whatever, there was a system of being allocated to one or the other. Okay, so the women spotted and they would delay out on the street and sometimes unfortunately have their baby before they didn't want to go to Division 1 because they, they saw the death rate there or they heard of it. So what on earth could be going on? Uh, if you do know, don't spoil it for the others, please. If you do know from before. Um, what else? He said, okay, well, let's try and make things equal. Let's try and make things equal. They were delivering babies, does it make sense, any medical people, I'm not a medical person, to deliver laterally to, on your side in Division 2. So he switched to Division 1 and said, you also have to deliver on the lateral position. So he made that the same. He got, they had to get the, laundry, the bed linen from the same launderer. Same diet. He told the priest not to ring the bell when he came. Apparently every time the priest came to visit somebody who was dying, he would ring the bell. And he, in one place, he had direct access to the ward, and everyone knew that was another death, and it frightened everybody. He says, let's not frighten anybody. Priest, please turn off your bell, and don't bother getting everyone afraid. So that didn't work. It wasn't that. It wasn't the laundry. It wasn't the food. It wasn't the that. And he, he didn't know either. He didn't know. Nobody knows yet what it is. Oh, they had also said, by the way, that some of the medical students were very rough with the women. And foreign medical students in particular. So they banned foreign medical students from delivering the women. And the doctors didn't. That's part of it, yeah, yeah, I think that's part of it. But let me tell you how he got figured it out. He didn't realize that. But one of his colleagues, one of the things I didn't tell you was one of the conditions for being in that hospital, it was a free hospital, was that if you died, you had to give your body for autopsy. Because that time in Europe was when pathology was getting big. And the big thing was we have to learn about the body through autopsy. So it was everywhere. And these women had to consent to autopsy ahead of time. And the midwife section, they were not doing autopsies. The guys on the other side were. The doctors. So now you can start to see the circle. And how he figured it out finally was while he was away on holiday, he came back and found that one of his own colleagues, who was a pathologist, obstetrician, had died of exactly the same sepsis that the women were dying of. It's a strep or a staph. I, 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 you'll see it in the book. when It's on the website, the story of it. And more, more than that, that doctor had been doing an autopsy with a student on a patient, and the student stabbed the doctor, and the doctor got infected and died with exactly that thing. So he said, okay, that must be it. That's got to be it. And he said, just what you said, the midwives are not there. The doctors were going from the morgue up to the ward to deliver babies. Mothers would die. They would be autopsied, and it would just keep going back and forth into the same ward. So he immediately put a bucket of lime, liquid first and then lime, and everybody, everybody had to wash their hands. Every doctor had to wash their hands going either to or from the autopsy room until there was no more smell in their hands from what they were doing in the autopsies. And then, it's too bad I don't have it on the slides here, but the column of numbers was 10%, 8%, 9% every month, and it dropped to less than 1% that same month of May of 1847. He tried to convince his colleagues to do it. They wouldn't, he didn't publish it. He was a poor writer. He didn't get along well. He was Hungarian. He wasn't Austrian. He wasn't of the establishment. He fell out with the bosses. He got moved to Budapest and so on. It took him about 15 years to write it up. Meanwhile, in the United States, Wendell Holmes, I think, in Boston was starting to get it right. Lister, the surgeon from Scotland, I think, who was immortalized in the name Listerine, that's Dr. Lister. Always remember, he was an infectious disease guy that got the wards clean with carbolic acid, if I think right, or carbolic something. Sounds, yeah, yeah. So they finally came around to it, and of course, Koch and Pasteur, and especially Koch, when they saw the germs in 1882, 83, 84, and finally cracked it open, that's when things started happening. 
But there are pictures in the book biography of William Osler. Here, our own sacred Saint William Osler, doing autopsies on, on smallpox patients in the 1870s here in Montreal with bare hands. I'm serious. Yeah. So, that's the mystery. Next week, we'll have a different one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim, and uh, good evening, everyone. I'm told to remind you that in a couple of days on the website, there will be answers, uh, written answers to uh, some of these questions, so please check those, uh, that website in a couple of days, and see you next week for another uh, session yeah. on uh, maternal health and child health in Canada. I'm sorry? Oh, you please fill out the questionnaires. There's an evaluation questionnaire. And you can leave that with our friends here. Yeah.